and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Baha'i Blogcast. I am so psyched and thrilled and titillated to be sitting down <laughs> with one of my very best uh, Baha'i brothers. A real inspiration for me, Mr. Justin Baldoni. Thank hi, you. Hi, Justin. That's very sweet of you. <sighs> Listen to the studio audience. They're going crazy. They're co- <laughs> come in this. Come in this way. Even a closer. Bit. Thank you. Yeah. That'll I'll be, be good. I'll get really close. So your your daughter, she's one years old now. She's uh, she's going to be one on Monday. She's going to be one on Monday. One Fantastic. on Monday. And she's being she's being put down in the other room. So she's can't... being put to sleep in the other. Put down seems a little intense. Yeah, that's she's, forgive me. That's... She's being uh, put to sleep. <laughs> put down. My uh, we're 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 sleep training, which is a which is a new thing. We're trying to like actually become better parents. So what, as opposed to what? <clears throat> she wasn't sleeping before? As opposed what? to, uh, you know, our lives are a little crazy right now. So uh-huh. it's hard to find that discipline of, okay, every day at this time she goes to sleep and this time and this time. Mm-hmm. And we've also been sleeping with her on our bed. Ooh, yeah. So we haven't really slept in a year. Oh. So, <laughs> so we finally reached that point where my wife was like, okay, I think it's time to... Uh, to separate her, so that's what she's doing now. In the nice, nice. So you're putting in her, her in her own room at night and stuff. Well, we haven't done that yet. My yeah. Emily is actually getting in the crib with her. So if we walked back there, she's in the crib with her, trying to get her to sleep, like sitting down with her. That's where we're at right now. Maybe we should get in the crib as well <laughs> and do the podcast from there. Let's do that. That'd be good. Um, no, that's it's brutal when you have to sleep train <sighs> a kid. And maybe this is uh, maybe there's a Baha'i lesson or a spiritual lesson to be found in this. But we did it with Walter when you have to. I think we did it at like eight or nine months or something like that, where you, you know, took him out of. He didn't sleep in our bed, but right next to our bed and like in his room and the whole thing. What's that? It's called like the Farabee training or the fer- fer- oh, Ferber, yeah, Ferber yeah, yeah. training. Yeah, and you and you sneak away and they're screaming as if they're gonna die, like their lungs are gonna bleed. They're screaming. Because they just want to be lying by their parents, but you really want them to individuate in the sense of having their own room and their own space, so they feel safe to sleep in there. So you can get a decent, nice sleep, so you can have a life. It's yeah, brutal. it's brutal though when you hear that, and every instinct in your body rises up because you hear your kids. Well, you screaming. think they're going to rupture their vocal cords? Yeah, like it's like that intense. People who don't have kids, they, they can't imagine that kind of screaming. It's just no, it's real. It's like yeah. But That's I know real. parents that let their kids sleep in the bed when until they're like 11, 12 or whatever, like, and they just, uh, so they only have one kid probably because no, I know ones that have, that have multiple kids, but they oh just, they can't bring themselves to like have that kid be in the other room. Yeah. we we've reached that point where my, my poor wife's like, okay, I think I need to, I think I need to, to sleep, to have a, to have an actual night's sleep soon. So we're going to do it. Yeah. I'm supporting it any way that I can. I do nothing. She does everything. What have you... I guess the spiritual lesson would be like uh, just, the te- just the tests. Spiritual the, the, lesson the pain of sleep of, training. The pain of, uh, the pain of being alive in the physical world and the pain of growing up because it's part of growing up. We, she's not in the womb anymore and then she's not next to the mom anymore and then she's not in the bed anymore. Well, what's crazy is if you think about it, a lot of the reasons why babies cry is because they're growing. So they're, they're teething. They have, a dentist told us recently that if an adult were to experience teething, yeah. we would have to be put down, like put to sleep, like put on an anest- whatever anesthesia. Not like, put down like, again. Like put, like not put down way. again, but like, <laughs> you know, and... And everything is growing in the baby. Their bones are stretching. They're in pain all the time. They yeah. have no way to talk about it. So they just cry. So maybe that's spiritual. Maybe there's a spiritual lesson there, which is this idea of, you know, strange it is uh, that I love you still. I'm happy that you've had sorrow. Like this idea of you're growing, but it's actually for your benefit. That everything in human existence has to go through an uncomfortable phase of growth uh, in order to reach its full development. So Let me see. You, did, you brought it all back around. Yeah, you said it, it beautifully. <laughs> Um, what, uh, what's it like being a dad one year? It's incredible. It's, it's crazy. It's stressful. It's, uh, 
someone put it such so eloquently. It's like your heart is existing outside of your body. Hmm. And so I look at my two, you know, my two girls and they're like everything to me. So then, so what I'm dealing with and struggling with now is this idea of everything I, I have to protect. Like, I want to make sure that they're taken care of and that they're comfortable. And then you start to think about your mortality and like, oh, but I need to, I want to mm. see her grow up. And I want to, and you start to think about, you know, how, and how, you know, because I'll, we're living in a very scary time. Like you can't sure. turn on TV or look at a paper or anything without being like bombarded with fear. You know, mm-hmm. just everyone, everything is just trying to scare you and people are dying and shootings and all these things. And you're, you're raising a little child that is defenseless and doesn't even understand what hate means yet. And it's a scare. So that's kind of what been this process recently of like, that's where faith has to come in. It's like, I, I want to protect them and I want to take care of them. But when we go outside the house, anything is possible. Anything can happen. Sure. So it's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. So, so that's one of the things I've been dealing with. The other thing is that like, I've also never been happier. Because mm. when they smile and when they laugh and when they walk for the first time, when I look at my daughter, she sees everything like she's seeing it for the first time because she is. She is. Yeah. And so you got to appreciate like life. Like I've never looked at that leaf over there, the green leaf and been like, oh, wow. But she's, that's one of her first words is wow. So she points at everything and says, wow. One of her first words is wow. Wow. That's fantastic. She just says wow all the time. Yeah. Which is really cool because if you think about it, we should have awe. Like yeah. we should be in awe over like God's creation. So yeah. yeah, the fact that that tree is green and she looks at it and she goes, wow, makes me go, yeah, wow, that's pretty cool. So that's there's, kind of, that's there's so thing. many quotes about that. I mean, it, it really staggers the mind, but, um, you know, science in, from, you know, from Plato and Socrates, it begins with awe, oh. you know, uh, and philosophy begins with awe. And it begins, and then the awe triggers curiosity, which takes us on our journey. Uh, and we forget that so easily as we get in the day-to-day of being adults. The, the idea of forgetting is also really fascinating because one of the, so one of the Arabic words for human, uh, insan, means they who forget. Mm. Which is interesting because Arabic is one of the oldest languages. Mm-hmm. So this idea that human beings are those who forget makes perfect sense but then of course we have the awe and the wonder which helps us remember but if you think about our whole lives our whole lives are pretty much trying to remember which is where faith comes in right which is why we're told to pray which is why we're told to do our obligatory prayers every day which is why we're told to fast once a year it's all to help us remember because we forget if i don't start my day with prayer and meditation i forget and i i believe the matrix you know what I mean? Oh my God. I, I'm in. I'm stuck in the matrix, and I believe that my life is about my next appointment or my conference call or going to Trader Joe's. And uh, an Orpheus has to show up at some point. And I need to take. <laughs> I need to take that red pill. And that's what prayer and meditation does. I think is it. It does. It. It has you. Oh, hmm. I'm a spiritual being inhabiting this body on this in this physical, physical journey for yeah. a while. Uh, the end game. The finish line isn't death the finish line is eternity mm-hmm. and uh and the tools that i use are our service and love oh right oh right 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 even then i still struggle uh, because like, we're suppo- if, it, if we didn't struggle then i guess there'd be no need for us to be here indeed it's about the struggle so you've um uh speaking of struggle i mean use that as, as a segue you've Do had it. some struggles um, oh yeah, I think I find your story is is as a Baha'i is, is similar to mine in a number of ways. It's it's dissimilar in a number as well. But um, take take us through for the listeners that aren't familiar with your story about about that spiritual journey because I'm I'm very struck by how you grew up, how you lost mm. faith, how you dealt with your your issues of ego, and. Then coming back into the Baha'i faith, um, and I'm uh, still dealing with my issues. Well, we always will. <laughs> we always will. But. Um, okay, so I was I was raised in a Baha'i family. Um, my mother was Jewish. She became a Baha'i in the '70s. Um, I think she first became a Christian, and then 
uh, probably was just a hippie for a while, traveling the country in a van, and then eventually found the faith. <laughs> nice. Um, probably similar to the van that you do your stuff in on Soul Tank. Oh, nice. Uh, We're getting rid of that van. Maybe she can, yeah, if she wants memories, it. Memories, stroll down memory lane. And then my dad was a Catholic, but as many Catholics didn't have any faith, was just a Catholic by, because that's just what Catholics are. Sure. Um, I know, but I do know some amazing Catholics, but he was just one of the ones that partied and drank and then... You know, every once in a while we'd go to confession because his mom would tell him to or something. Right. Um, so grew up in in a family where they had both found the faith. Um, my mom was definitely the the spiritual weight of the family, um, but she had found the faith at an older age. So she didn't grow up knowing all of the writings, and, and she was still exploring it herself. And my dad, in many ways, probably became a Baha'i for my mom because he loved my mom and didn't want to lose her. Sure. Um, so... I grew up in a family that was Baha'i, but not, it wasn't like in our DNA, Baha'i. So um, I, I remember we moved to Oregon when I was 10, and we moved pretty far away from everything. And I, it was a born again Christian community. Um, Ashland, Oregon. Uh, it was actually Applegate, Oregon, which was f- deep, deep into the, wow. deep, deep into the country. Smaller than Ashland. Much smaller. Population wow. probably. 1100 or 1200 no or kidding wow. oh yeah but the town is built around a church hmm. so there's one road from the city um that goes out to where we lived and that one road that in the city has you know seventy five thousand. on sundays you was just traffic the whole way up because this church had like it was like a super church it had like twenty thousand people holy moly so everywhere i would go i always felt like i was a i was a minority because i didn't i wasn't I wasn't a born again Christian, which means growing up in your formative age from ten to eighteen means you're going to hell. Which so it was very hard for me to make friends. I didn't really understand that much about what I believed. I knew I was a Baha'i. I knew about Baha'u'llah. I said Baha'i prayers, but I was constantly being told, and the idea was reinforced that I wasn't uh, I wasn't a chosen one. Right. Um, and then of course, uh, two, the year two thousand was coming, and. They all started like selling things because the rapture was coming. I started learning more about that, and then I realized, like, you know, it was it was it was one of those kind of places. Do you know how I spent the uh, the millennium with my wife, the year two thousand, uh, in a motel in Sisters, Oregon, uh, eating pizza and watching The Matrix? That's a great way to spend it. Yeah, we're like, oh, the world is going to collapse. Let's watch the Matrix. <laughs> Speaking of the Matrix, yeah, Y two K. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so it was just a very weird time for me. While these people were amazing, um, the beliefs were just different, inherently different. Where I didn't believe they were going to hell, but they believed I did. I was. Um, so growing up, it really kind of affected me. When I reached high school, um, I I had faith, but I also didn't because I was the only Baha'i. Right. So there was no other Baha'is anywhere, um, but yet I was still the only kid that didn't drink. Did you do uh, Baha'i like summer schools or winter schools? At no, all, I didn't or? do Baha'i because I was a, I was an athlete, so I would play mm-hmm. soccer. So my all my summers were sports, 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 sports. And to a certain extent, I don't know if my parents necessarily uh, knew all the opportunities, or you know, every, they were just doing their best. Sure. And we were pretty far removed. Yeah. So um, I didn't have a chance to go to all the summer schools. I've never, I still never been to Bosch. I've still never been to these. Um, to a lot of these places that now my friends have been to. So I was just very kind of trying to, I was trying to find my own identity. I was still praying, um, but I didn't really know what I believed. And that's when struggles started happening. I tore my hamstring. I lost my scholarships. At 18, my then world ended. Wow. Um, and I was kind of forced to... And did you do any acting back then in, in high no. school or anything like that? No. So in high school, I, I was so far from possibly becoming an actor, it was not even in the back of my mind. I was an ugly duckling. I had... I had a, I mean, I have a prominent nose now, but back then it was... Everything was growing at different times. So when I look back at photos... You had an enormous schnoz. I had a huge schnoz. Uh, schnoz. How do you say schnoz? Schnoz. Schnoz? Yeah, there you go. Schnoz. Um, and I never got the girl. Like, it was never... It was just... Never something that I thought I could be. Um, and so, yeah, so no no acting. I was just sports only. And then I tore my hamstring, kind of went through this depression, and ended up in L.A. And in L.A., I was running, I was trying to run track at Long Beach State. I couldn't run. I fell in love. I got into this relationship. Um, I ended up in, in, living with this girl, mm-hmm. um, which to my Baha'i parents was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I said, I'm in love. And turned out she was 
um, not the best for me. Mm-hmm. Um, found out there was other stuff going on. Got my heart just smashed into a million pieces. And in the the all the broken pieces that were the former shell of what Justin was was where I found my faith for the first time. Mm-hmm. I remember sitting on a couch. Uh, I had left Long Beach because it was so painful for me to even be there. Um, and I had moved to, I, my dad had kept an office in LA. There was nothing in the office except a couch. Oh, really? There was no food. He was, he, and it was just there in case he ever decided to come back to LA. And it was like, he was probably getting it for like nothing. But it was a couch in the Wilshire Corridor. And I had nothing. I, I was sleeping on that couch. She had just left me. Uh, and she was cheating on me, this whole thing. And I was balled into this couch, screaming and crying, saying, please, Baha'u'llah, take this pain away. Please, and I just never between the, the 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 dream of becoming an athlete to getting my heart broken to not doing that well in school and just being feeling lost. It was just this. Please do something. With well, my life. isn't it interesting coming back to the sleep training? Um, <laughs> the uh, how in those times of extreme pain, yeah, that's when we reach out. That's when we reach out. That's when we ask for help. And that's where we connect. Yeah. There's so many times in my life when it was only through anguish in my life that I was found myself on my knees saying the tablet of Ahmad, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, we forget. And like parents, you know, God is always there to like pick us up, mm-hmm. you know, he's the help in peril. We say that every day in the obligatory right. prayer. So this was this was my first time really experiencing real hardship, like real, real kind of adult. Just I, you know, I couldn't eat. I'd lost like probably twenty pounds, and I was just so lost and confused. And it was in that kind of period of about a month while I was sleeping on this couch, not knowing what to do with my life, that I reached out to the Baha'is in LA, mm. and I started to get connected with the Baha'is. And now, were you? Did you do that? WB show was it Everwood? Was that what it was called? Yeah, so this was a couple years later. I did it, or about a year later, I did Everwood, yeah. So this was before Everwood. This was pre Everwood. Okay, okay. This was this was my whole, this was when I first really found my faith, and uh, I reached out to the Baha'is here in LA. Yeah. And, um, and in that same building where I was sleeping on the couch, I was walking in one day, and a guy said, Are you an actor? And I said, No. And he said, Well, you want to be. And that was a, 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 two months later, I got my first TV movie. Uh, on the Hallmark Channel, and uh, eight months later, I got Everwood. That's insane, and it was, and it was crazy. That it was so <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> and I was so far removed from that even being a possibility. Yeah, that I just jumped right into it because yeah. it felt right, and it was the beginning of me. Um, Abdul Baha says, "Faith is conscious knowledge, and then the practice of good deeds." And, he, and this idea of like you you know something, and then you do something. And it was the first idea of when I reaching out to Baha'u'llah and saying, "Please, God." do something with my life help me let me be of service in some way and then connecting with the Baha'is uh, meeting Andy Grammer for the first like Andy had just I remember, I'll never forget I met Andy he was he flew in from New York and he was playing like an open mic and he was testing out a song at this thing called Crimson Spot back in yeah back, back in the Baha'i in, back Center in the, I remember back that back in the Baha'i Center yeah. and he's his first night in LA he ended up staying with me in that apartment sleeping on that same couch and that's how we became friends that's 12 amazing years ago. that's amazing but that feeling of like, like just starting to take a, a step and know that I'm taking a step. I don't know where I'm going to go, but um, I'm doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. I was broken. I was praying. So what, uh, you reached out to the Baha'i community, but was there some other, uh, was there some other mystical thing that happened at that point in time? Or you just decided to give this Baha'i faith thing a shot? So, well, the thing was, I'd always known, I'd always known in my heart that I was a Baha'i, but, uh, had never really fully practiced it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I had to be broken to practice it. But what happened next was I started acting. Mm-hmm. And I quickly forgot why right. I was starting to have these blessings. Um, I would start, you know, I would, I would talk about the faith. I would go to the Crimson Spots. I would hang out with people. I would teach the faith. But what was happening was I was, I was being healed, right? The brokenness of me was being healed. But it was also being healed through popularity. Right. And while that was healing, my ego was growing. Mm. Because here's this kid that had never had a chance of becoming an actor, and then suddenly I'm an actor. Hadn't even tried to be an actor. I was not a very good actor, uh, but people were blowing smoke up my butt. Uh-huh. Um, so when I got this TV show, Everwood, 
Um, it was all, oh, thank you, God. I'm going to be of service with this. I'm going to do so good. And before I knew it, it was just all about money and fame. And I was 21 and girls and all this stuff. And I completely forgot every lesson that I had thought I had learned that yeah. night when I was sitting on the couch. Yeah. And as quickly as it came, it was taken away. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Being taken, having the that show being, was canceled, or you the show, were the fired show. Or I was or... the true story was they were never going to invite me back because I just wasn't good. <laughs> just uh-huh. I just wasn't a good actor. Um, but they, uh, they, the show ended up getting canceled. I wouldn't have ended up coming back. Um, and from that point on, I I didn't really work, and I had to go through the dark night of the soul, so to speak. Um, to to really figure out who I was and find my faith. Did you kind of think like, oh, I, I was a regular on a TV show. Now, of where's my next TV show? This well, is... you're 21 and it just happens overnight, of course. You just start to think like, yeah. oh, I'm making this much money and people know me and I'm taking photos with people. And it's just a lot for a 21-year-old kid, whether you have a spiritual foundation or not, to get thrust into any type of fame, mm-hmm. let alone like very, very minor celebrity. Like, and, I, and I'm well aware now that what I have now this Jane the Virgin thing. It's a very it's very minor celebrity. It's a it's a a hundredth of what you experienced in the office. However, it can very, very quickly go to your head. Yeah. So <clears throat> my journey was just simply about um, finding faith, forgetting, getting smacked in the face, having God press the reset button, and then, you know, having to figure out how to how to build something out of the ashes of what used to be my life. And that happened two or three times. And it happened it repeated itself and repeated itself. And Abdul Baha says that, you know, Man who's it's man who sees himself unfit um, will continue to have the same tests in greater degrees until those weaknesses become strengths. And what I experienced was, you know, I fell into the same exact relationship a couple of years later. I lived with the girl, and here I was, like a Baha'i, talking about things, and then falling out of the faith and living with this person, and again getting cheated on. Why? Because I wasn't being, I wasn't me. I wasn't walking in my purpose. You know, I I know in my heart that. I am here to be of service to Baha'u'llah, to be of service to humanity, to figure out a way to teach people about um, what I believe, not through my words, but through my actions. Yeah. And I was literally doing the opposite of everything I believed. So I would go to sleep every night, and in the back of my head, I would have this anxiety, this feeling of like being stuck in between who I am and who I know I can be. And that continued and continued until I wasn't able to, to break away from it, and then guess what happened? Boom, it all explodes. God presses reset, you're left with nothing. And where did I end up? I ended up on Andy Grammer's couch. <laughs> and again, Something having about you and out, Andy and couches. And couches. I ended up on a couch exactly where I was, you know, five years earlier in my mid-twenties with no acting job, with no money, with houses in foreclosure, all because I wasn't really walking in, in the footsteps that I know that I could be. I wasn't really, mm. I wasn't, my faith wasn't act, uh, activated. I was believing something, but I wasn't doing it. And um, what's nice about that quote about from Abdul Baha is that he says that faith is two things. It's not just one. It's mm. you have to know something, and then it's through that knowledge you have to do something. Yeah. And you can't just know something, right? You can't just oh I know that. That's not faith. And you can't just do something not knowing why. That's not faith either. Mm-hmm. It's the it's like the the sperm and the egg together. It's like that that entity that comes together so let's, which creates faith. Let's talk about that a little bit. What do you what do you know? Nothing. What do you know about your faith? I know my faith. I know my faith is love. Okay. And compassion and understanding and service. I know my faith is a remedy for all of those things I was saying uh, scare the crap out of me in this world. All those things that I'm afraid of. Uh, as a father, as a new father, and as a husband, I know the faith is a remedy, uh, a, a specific prescription for exactly what humanity is dealing with today. And I know my faith can heal. Um, what's also interesting is that I don't believe that it's that it's specifically just our faith, because I believe also that the fundamental belief of my faith and your faith and my friends who grew up in mm-hmm. Applegate, Oregon's faith are ident- identical. It's the changeless faith of God, right? eternal in the past, eternal in the future. And it's the and same source. The same source, and that it's not my responsibility to make anybody believe what I believe. However, if I can, through my actions, mm-hmm. 
help people remember even their own faith, um, find a faith, or find just a way of life that that helps in some way, then then I think that I'm doing or trying to be practicing. What so I Ruhi Book 5 really blew my mind in a lot of different ways. I just took it this last year with my wife and some other friends, and um, there's so much great stuff in it. Uh, I was talking to you earlier in the kitchen uh, about the idea of false dichotomies that it brings up so much in book five. But the other one, too, is that twofold uh, moral purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear a little bit behind what you're saying is that one thing that you know your faith to be is in that twofold moral purpose is, of course, making ourselves a better person and trying to make the world a better place. So it's it's internal and it's external. It's It's self-knowledge. And its service to the world. So you know that your faith heals you and makes you a more humble, giving, compassionate, kind man. Uh, and you also know that your faith has the ability to help others and uh, and can be put towards service in the world. Mm. That's what I'm hearing a little bit. I, I just like that idea of that. It sounded too. way better than when I said it. No, no, I don't know about that. Um, let's not let's not get into an ego thing here. I'm just kidding. Um, but that is um, so. Let's fast forward a little bit because one of the things that I when we just started to get to know each other, your acting career was on the skids. Oh yeah. So are we gonna. So you're responsible. Are we gonna get into that? I think you're responsible for why I'm uh, I'm an actor for your success. You're, you I owe you everything. No, come on. <laughs> Come on! I'll never forget that pep. Let's you gave me a, you gave me a pep talk. I gave time. you several pep talks, but a... but what I love is um, uh, that you your acting career just was on the skids. I mean, you were kind of dumped by your manager and had a crappy agent. You couldn't get arrested after a good deal of success as an actor. You were a series regular on big TV shows, and uh, and that's when you started directing and kind mm. of taking creative charge of your own life. And um, and that started with that armed video of yeah. that music video of Devin Gundry's song Armed, and he was in that little posse, the Andy Grammer posse yeah. was had Devin and they were roommates, Adam Monshine and yeah. um, a bunch of you crazy uh, artist types in LA. But uh, tell talk about that transition. I, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, so that was a big one, and I, and I probably should have mentioned that earlier. So. One of the things that I found was when everything started to, when everything started, thank you, Rain. I was covering my mouth. When everything started to fall, well, yeah, done. I know, so I don't, uh, when everything started to fall apart, I, uh, I looked, I looked at the things that I loved, and one of the things that I loved, I'd always loved, was filmmaking, and directing. I used to turn in movies instead of book reports in high school, um, and. Devin had just released this song, um, Armed, and it was also during a time of extreme hardship. I had a lot of hardship in my 20s, um, and I remember driving, and we were going through we were, we were going through a similar time to I think what we're experiencing now in our country. It was back. It was the it was the war. It was the um, it was the mortgage crisis, and everyone was losing their homes, me included. It was all these things. Um, I remember every time I turned on the news, there was a new soldier being. You know, all these soldiers were being killed, and people were these these wives were becoming widow, widow, widows, and there was just so much pain. And I heard this song, um, "Armed with the Power of My Name," nothing can ever hurt me, and it was so beautiful. And Devin is so brilliant when it comes to music composition. And I saw the whole thing in my head, and uh, I, I called him and I said, "Hey, Devin, can I can I turn this into a music video?" Uh, can I direct this? Can I? And, and I said, I'll fund it because I had a little bit of money left. And he's like, do you know how? And I said, no, but I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so I just started calling people. And through that act of service, because I wanted to I wanted to create something that could help. Get that song out. Get that, help and get that song out. the healing message of that song. But also, like, every, it was there was so much pain everywhere I was looking. Um, right. And the song helped me so much. I remember listening to that song and just bawling. Mm. Um, and I just experienced... Uh, some tremendous loss uh, sitting by my uncle as he passed away and my both my grandmothers had passed in the same month and it was my first time really experiencing death and what that was like which eventually will lead us to another conversation I'm sure uh, about my last days but I went and I created this really as an act of service with no other intention except to 
um, give the Baha'is um, uh, something to share the faith with, and also whether you were a Baha'i or not, to be able to watch this and in some way have a journey through the human experience to, you know, to to feel something. And it, it kind of became our first Baha'i viral video. It was, I was only on Vimeo. I just started at that time, and it did like 100,000 views, and everyone was sharing it everywhere. Right. And the coolest thing was when I went, I went back to Oregon, and I actually found out, we'll bring it full circle, I, was, I went back to Oregon for a week, and I was over at my friend's house, and they were a part of this big church. And they're like, oh, Justin, you got to see this video. We just watched it in church today. It's so cool. Oh, that's great. And it was armed. That's so they great. had shown armed, right, this beautiful video that was all a Baha'i quote, one quote. But there was not like we didn't like you know show the Baha'i faith in any in any capacity. It was just about humanity. Yeah. They'd shown it in the same church that I would that I was told my whole life that I was going to hell at. So it was the perfect example of what the Baha'i faith is. It's a universal message of love and peace. That project changed my entire life mm. because I found that I had an ability to be of service in a new way, mm. to tell stories that could maybe help people feel something or help people remember something or help them going as they're going through something. And that led me on a completely new life path. So as acting had fallen apart, when you and I had talked and I had nothing and all every single door had closed, I went to this other area, which was like, well, how can I actually be, how can I be of service? Maybe this is all closing because I was doing this stuff for me. Because I was, truthfully, like I wasn't acting for as to be. But there's something so passive about being an actor, just like waiting for the phone to ring, hoping for an audition, hoping for a better agent. <laughs> no control and, of your destiny. Exactly. And uh, I really admired that about you were like, you know, screw that. I'm going to do, I'm going to be creative. I'm going to move things forward. I, I, I admire what you did. And I will take some partial credit because I did <laughs> say to you, here's, there's a few things I can take credit for. You said a lot. Of the, but one of them was, dude. You stick with the directing. Trust me. Eventually, the door is going to open back up to the acting thing. You never know when it's going to happen. You called and it. And it's going to happen. And all of a sudden, you're going to be. They're going to be like, "Hey, you can act too. Come in here and do this acting thing." You don't know when it's going to come. And then, yeah. boom. You called it, man. Uh, that happened with with Jane the Virgin uh, a couple years later. I'll never forget being 25 and talking to the great Rain Wilson oh, about geez, acting. Can, please. Oh no, it's like, true, man. You were like, it was like the peak of everything for you and I was so broken and lost and just confused and I'm like what the hell's going on my because everybody I knew was like what why isn't it why, why are you so broke why is this not working for you like why are you not auditioning how can you not get in and I just couldn't understand but that's when I realized I was forcing my will yeah like I was like oh I'm here to be an actor because that's what everyone says I should be mm -hmm. instead of what I now realize was God saying, you need to experience more hardship. I'm going to close all these doors so you can find that capacity, that unique thing that I put in you so that you can be of service. Or, or and simply that God's will is like, you know, no, Justin, you're not just going to be a series regular on some dumb TV show. You're going to bring a lot more to the equation. You have, you more. have more talents. Yeah. You have more capacity. It's about increasing your capacity. And you were brave enough to, to step up. But I... I remember during those early days of you uh, being a director, that's when we were founding Soul Pancake and we had kind of pivoted over to being a media company. We were lucky enough to get that YouTube deal and get some funding for our YouTube channel. And we were looking for shows. And I remember having a, a meeting with the Soul Pancake team and I said, one of the topics I really want to cover is death. And uh, this was super, super early on. I was like, no one talks about death. It's not on any TV shows. Everyone's terrified of it, blah, 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 blah. Nothing happened. Then like a month later, they were like, Rain, you're not going to believe it. Justin Baldoni came in and pitched shows to us. And he wants to do one on death. And it's called My Last Days. And here's his way in. We learn about life from people who are at the end of their lives. We learn about joy and fulfillment and purpose from people who uh, maybe have weeks or months to live. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. That's a perfect... Because I had no idea how to go in that door. I just knew that was a topic that we needed mm. to get into. We wanted to explore life's big questions. We wanted to explore what it means to be a human being. And how can you explore what it means to be a human being without, you know, digging into, into death. So, um, tell us uh, a little, tell us listening audience a little bit about, about that, mm. that experience. So I think 
My Last Days is the... It's been... My, I mean, this show, it's really been my life for mm-hmm. the last four years. I was going again through another... I was. I just started dating my now wife, and we were going... We were dating, and I was experiencing another big round of hardship. Um, and uh, all, the, all my charms weren't working. Uh, I, I... Acting wasn't happening... I had just really gone deep into my faith. I had visited uh, Haifa. I had prayed and asked to be of service in any way that I can be. I said, just use me. Um, But I was still being caught in this, uh, trying to court this woman and trying to be a young Baha'i and um, all of these crazy things that come up in that world while also losing acting. And it was was a night of prayer. um, And uh, I had... I just I felt this prompting to go sit down on my computer and I just started writing and I wrote like 15 things like 15 for some they were just like short snippets of what sh- like shows I would want to bring into the world yeah. um, to create that could all do something and I'll never forget my last days just came out and it definitely wasn't of me I had I had, had a lot of very personal intimate experiences that involved death and dying mm-hmm. um, at a very young age and I'd always felt a strong connection with people as they were getting closer. A lot of people my age would run, and I would always want to go. Hmm. So I'd want to, like, you know, being 20 years old and holding my uncle's hand, flying there because I didn't know him that well as he was going through and dying. And no one else in the family had any experience with it. I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. He was suffering. I remember I remember tr- praying and trying to figure it out, and the nurses were not, didn't know what to do because they couldn't, the pain medicine wasn't working, and... Or calling people that he maybe had unresolved things with and letting them say goodbye and calling family members that couldn't come and letting them say goodbye. Wow. Going and being 20 and having these intense experiences. and and uh, That's funny because we just... Um, I forget the woman's name, but we were just talking at Soul Pancake about this incredible woman who's a death doula. Yeah, that exists. And uh, that idea... Death that, walkers. Yeah, they, they transition you. They help you in the transition. Just yeah. like a doula helps bring a baby into the world with a midwife. Um, helps on the other end. Some of the most amazing people. That, by the way, there's no difference between birth and death. And that's a whole other thing that we can talk about in another podcast. It's just a different birth. It's just a different type. It's a different place. Um, but anyway, so I had this amazing experience. And that night, my last days came out. Yeah, birth is just being death. Is death to the womb. It's death right? to the womb. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, I could talk for hours on birth and death because after witnessing and watching my daughter come into this life, it changed everything for me. Wow. Um, so my last days happened. You guys took a chance. You said, I'm, I'll never forget, you said, Justin, no one will probably watch this, but it needs to happen. Like, <laughs> we need people, we need people to see this and it's crazy and it's exactly what Soul Pancake is. We're bold and we're going to talk about things no one wants to talk about. And, uh, and lo and behold, millions and, of people watched it. And lo it. and behold, but that intention of you guys being able to take that like risk and say, like, hey, we're going to put this up even though it's unpopular and talk about something that, that matters because mm-hmm. the one thing that we can, that every, all seven billion of us on this planet can connect with is that one day this, this flock of us will not be here. Yeah. And every day, there's like 300,000 people that die every minute. It's like crazy. And it's not, it's, it's everywhere and our families and our, you know, it's, it's all going to happen, but yet we don't talk about it. And then Baha'u'llah is so interesting in the fight, in the faith, he says, meditate on it. He actually tells us to meditate yeah. on dying because it will inform the choices we make. In Cooper our lives. Dunbar talks about that all the time. He always quotes that, but yeah, it, it gives you, it's the ultimate perspective on everything, on morality and purpose. And again, that the, the finish line is not our physical death. Yeah. Who knows what if there is a finish line? Um, anyway, yeah. keep going. No, so. no, no. But it changed. But it, so, anyways, this process of trying to um, to glean lessons from people in their final in their last days yeah. was such a radical thing, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. First of all, I'd never made a documentary, just like I'd never made a music video, um, and it was a quite it was a it was quite a learning experience. But that process of almost in some ways being like a death doula, like you talked about, mm-hmm. that's re- that was really my job, to go into these families that had not really talked about these experiences with each other yeah, and ask them to open up and be vulnerable with a, with a small camera crew. Um, 
And what we found every single time we did this show was that our intention shifted. And our intention went from be- making great content to being a source of healing. Because we realized, I realized that every t- person I talked to hadn't actually talked about this stuff to other people. Mm. And the mothers hadn't talked about it with their kids. And the brothers hadn't talked about it with their sisters. So we would try to, in some way, unite the family. And naturally, then we started creating experiences. The experiences weren't some like r- random thing that we just decided to do because we wanted to, more people to watch it. Experiences were a natural thing that happened because... What are we, some of the experiences you're talking about? Oh, uh, Christopher Eif. Christopher Eif. They got tattoos. Had, Christopher Eif had always wanted to get a tattoo, yeah. um, but they didn't have any money, and they had been traveling, and um, they probably w- wouldn't have done it for what a, about that airplane for a ride long time. That he, took? he loved, like, he, he was on a bucket list thing around, you know, he wanted to go around the world and try crazy things. So we found that an experience for him to go into the flying. It was basically a go kart that could fly, which was very scary. <laughs> I would, you know, um, and then you know, but uh, tattoos, and then you know, for. Uh, for Zach Sobiak, we created the music video. Yeah. Um, you know, for Ryan Woods, we they had this big life, um, they had this big life uh, end of life celebration that you know we helped with, and then we ended up raising money for them and trying to you know. So we did all these things as a way to be of service to these people, and what mm-hmm. ended up happening was I think that came through, and people were really really touched, and it became as you know like this massive massive thing um, that for me changed my life because now. I'm around it all the time. So that idea of meditating on death is something that I'm surrounded with. So the one thing for me that I can tell you is that it's helped me remember. It doesn't change, it hasn't changed who I am. Like every day I'm still this guy that battles his ego and his lower nature. But what it does do is it I'm surrounded so much by this idea of realizing how temporary this world is, mm-hmm. is that it helps me come back so much faster. So if I'm annoyed at my wife or I'm uh, struggling with work or you know my ego gets hurt or whatever it is it's just this quick thinking I think about Zach or Chris or Julie or Ryan yeah. or Joel or who, all these different people I'm like wait a second and it kind of brings me back I had two friends last year die just like that they just brain aneurysms two of them perfectly healthy guys in their late 40s Jesus. Um, within a couple months good friends of mine they just keeled over and they just were no more and um, it happens. It, it really messes with you. It makes you. It just shines a light on the fact that it can happen to any of us. Yeah. So that was a, a very successful show, and little did we know that that would really take off and become these kind of digital viral hits, especially the the Zach Sobiek one. Um, that was what twenty two minutes long. How long was it? It's a twenty two minute long. Yeah. Video, video on, on, online on Soul Pancake, and uh, it got millions and millions of views, tens of millions of views. Yeah. And music video that came out of it. He passed away shortly thereafter. Uh, we were able to raise a lot of money um, with your efforts and Soul Pancake's efforts, and um, for um, research into his mm-hmm. his cancer. Yeah. So that was some... The song hit number one on iTunes. All that money went to his Zach, the Zach Sobiak Osteosarcoma Fund. And t- there's some interesting things that happened with that. Do you, can you talk about that? Uh, with the fund itself? Yeah. Well, just the idea that, uh, you know, it's a very underfunded type of cancer. Yeah. So, you know, and Zach spent his life in the hospital watching people, watching kids die. Yeah. So he would share hospital rooms during during chemo, and there was seven eight year olds that yeah. wouldn't make it. And he said, you know, I at least at least I got to be seventeen. Um, you know, they don't. So he wanted to make sure he dedicated his life to finding some sort of cure. And um, after the documentary went viral, the song hit number one after he passed away. Uh, he became the first artist ever unsigned to hit number one. He beat Beyonce that week. Wow. Um, and like millions and millions of downloads later. Uh, uh, they were able to donate all those funds to the Zach Sobiak Osteosarcoma Research Center where they are making huge strides um, in finding the po- looks like the genome that causes his specific type of cancer because it's a very tricky disease. So in a way, the sacrifice of his life and his music and this fundraising effort may have been the catalyst that helps find a cure for this particular that kind could, of cancer. That could save millions of lives. Yeah. And it all started with this idea of service. Yeah. And a quote from Baha'u'llah that said, I've made death a messenger of joy for thee, wherefore dost thou grieve. And how that way, how can death be joyful? But then if you look at Zach, if you look at the people around him, if you look at what he's what his legacy was, if you look at the joy that you get when you listen to that song, and then when you look at, wow, 
Think about the joy that can come from saving millions and millions of lives one day with, you know, his sacrifice. You can look at it in this interesting, joyful way. That's great. So another show that you did for us at Soul Pancake early on um, sparked another great interest for you and is uh, has a fascinating story with it, and that is Stories from the Street. Mm. So tell us uh, about that. So growing up in the faith, I remember hearing a quote about how it says, tell the rich of the midnight sighing over the poor. And it's one line, it's one sentence, but... It's from the hidden words. Everything, that it, it there's so much encapsulated in that one sentence that just struck me. Like, tell the rich of the midnight sighing of the poor. And this idea of while I'm sleeping in my nice bed, not that I'm rich, but while I'm sleeping in my nice bed, in my home with my family, mm-hmm. there is someone who has nothing out on the street with no food, hunger, hungry, cold. <clears throat> and, I just, and the sighing of like the pain of that. And it's always struck me. There wasn't a lot of homeless people growing up uh, where I grew up in Oregon. Um, and when I moved to L.A., I was kind of shocked at how many people were just everywhere that were just in need. And I would, you know, you walk around L.A. or in New York or these, these big cities, you have this kind of struggle of like, well, do I give them money? Like, because sure. everyone's asking for things. And then, of course, we're told to not give money. So I started buying food. And then it's hit or miss, you know. I'd say 20% of the people don't want food. They just want money. Um, mm-hmm. And homelessness is a, it, 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 it's weighed heavy on my heart because it's not something that I think that we can just fix overnight because so much of it has to do with mental illness and yes. things like that. Um, so you can't just provide a solution because, you know, you're... Yeah, and that whole, that old trope of, well, there's the two sides. I guess the left would just kind of just build more shelters, which doesn't really take care of the problem. It's just people in a nicer bed. And yeah. then the political right would say, you know, get a job, yeah. you know, but you're dealing with addiction and mental illness. It's a very complicated it's, issue. It's very and polarized. Um, so, but the big thing for me was that, you know, we're supposed to see all men as friends. Mm-hmm. Right, we're not supposed to see people as strangers. We're supposed to look at people and see God and all. And look at the work Abdul Baha did in Akka with homeless, with the homeless and the very, very poor. And the the, the first place he came to when he came to America was he went to the home. He went to Skid Row. Mm-hmm. Like he came here and he, you know, went down to the Bowery. He didn't. The reason he didn't take the Titanic was because he gave, he wanted them. He wanted the New York Baha'is to give the money to the to the to the poor to the homeless, um, which is interesting. It's a whole other story. So, uh, but as I was, as I've spent time in LA, I would watch people as they would walk by the homeless and I would see somebody who was sitting on the street, hot and, you know, hungry and people would just walk by like they, they, like that wasn't a human being, like that wasn't somebody that was born just the way that we were and Mm -hmm. was breastfed hopefully, or, you know, has feelings and pain. They're just walking, just ignored, walk by. And that really hurt me. Like just seeing a, a, a human being ignore someone else. And I had heard a, a, a pastor talk about his experience when he was homeless. Um, the biggest thing was that he felt invisible. So the reason I came up with stories from the street was I wanted to find a way to give a voice to those people that we ignore. Mm-hmm. And if you could watch this show, right, and you watched this three-minute documentary of the person that you walk by on the street, and then you realize that that person has kids, or grandkids, they were they're a veteran. They fought in our they fought for our country. They're one, they're part of the reason why we have freedom. They have a career. Or they had a they career. had a career. Um, they've been in love. Uh, all of these things, and maybe <clears throat> maybe you could at least look at them in the eye and say, "Hey, I don't have anything, but you know, what's your name? Have a conversation. Give them a hug. Hey, I I, I you know, are you hungry? Whatever it was. And the whole so the whole purpose of that idea was to just try to create awareness that these that homeless people are not all crazy. A lot of people just have been very down on their luck, and then they've gotten used to being homeless. Um, so yeah, so and then of course you guys were able to put that on Soul Pancake, and, and but that and that turned and the the, the what makes that the story so uh, you know delightful is that you put this into action uh, with your work with the homeless and your what do you call it your ho- your homeless hoedown jamboree. <laughs> Fun for the homeless, the, where you, uh, the you annual, have clowns. The annual and, homeless carnival. Yes. The annual, <laughs> you bring in... The homeless hoedown. Uh, That's you, amazing. You bring in uh, Ferris wheels and little mini roller coasters, bumper so, cars, so, the homeless. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've got balloon animals. 
Cotton candy. Sounds like the, <laughs> oh, so eight eight years ago, I um I started uh, I started going using my birthday to celebrate um people on Skid Row. So it was, I had very few friends. There was like six of us. We would we would make food and we would get clothes and we would go down to Skid Row. And we knew that there was nothing that we could do that could actually solve the problem. We knew that we wouldn't like giving a hundred people sandwiches isn't going to fix anything. And they're just going to be hungry a couple hours later. And whatever clothes we had, it wasn't going to actually do anything. But what we could do is connect with 30 to 50, 60 people in those two or three hours. So every year on my birthday, we started to do that in lieu of a party. Because I always felt weird. There's this thing that happens in, in L.A. and I'm sure it's everywhere. But it's just this feeling of throwing myself a birthday party is just, it was the most uncomfortable thing for me. Like just this feeling of, come celebrate me. Like let's all go to a club or a party or come come over and give me presents and yeah. I just was never able to do that. Um, but every day there's people on Skid Row that have birthdays, and nobody celebrates them. Mm-hmm. Nobody. Mm-hmm. It goes back to that quote. Um, so we thought if we could just connect with people, it wasn't about the food. It was about clothing and feeding their souls. And you know that'd be a great way to celebrate my birthday and so year after year we did it we did it and it was very small and it grew and then there was 30 people and then 40 people and then 60 people but what are you doing now because it's it's pretty so now extravagant so now what happened was after jane the virgin hit and i started to build a little bit of notoriety i had a crazy idea i said you know what's never happened on skid row the worst place in america what if we threw a carnival because carnivals are about joy. Carnivals are fun. Carnivals are, are supposed to bring relief, and they're supposed to make you feel good. I'm like, what if we gave them a day where they could forget about being homeless, mm-hmm. and they could interact with people that they would never interact with, that mm-hmm. would normally be afraid of them, and we could have a day where everybody was just the same and equal. And I didn't even think about all of the safety ramifications that would, that could possibly come out of something <laughs> like that. And I just did it. I did and. I just started to make phone calls, and I said, I'm throwing a carnival on Skid Row. And Did you get, like, permits? You have to the work? first year, I didn't get a permit. I called my friends at the Union Rescue Mission, who I had done some really interesting work for, that were like, yep, yeah, let's do it. We did it in their back parking lot. And what we did was we created an experience where the homeless would line up, and the volunteers would line up, and one by one, a volunteer and a homeless person would walk through the carnival together. So we would have sections for clothing, we'd have sections for food, we'd have feet washing we'd have face painting we'd have these carnival games that you referenced you'd have all these feet, things feet washing that's feet washing very stages. jesus-like it, very jesus-like but that but if you think about it we're supposed to be servants right we're mm-hmm. supposed and what better way to connect with somebody than to wash their feet and to look at them in the eye and talk to them while that's happening will you wash my feet when we're done with this I, interview I, I, I don't have the plastic gloves but otherwise I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but anyway so it was this Amazing experience. We had a dance party, and for those three hours on that you day, you had a homeless dance party. We had a dance party. So like we a had, band we or brought a DJ. In a DJ. Or we like played like the Macarena to all the '90s hits to Michael Jackson, and everybody danced. All the volunteers. Oh, that's great! And for three hours, you couldn't tell who was homeless and who wasn't. And it, people were, you know, we had 300 volunteers come out the first time. We called it a carnival, and everybody left saying this was the. One of the best days I've ever had. Mm. Um, so, Beautiful. so we came back the next year, which was this this last year in January, and I shut down the whole street. I permitted for the first time, and I got security, and I did the whole thing the right way. But I permitted, and I blocked off the entire block of San Julian um, from fifth to sixth, and we threw the largest party Skid Rose ever had. We had a thousand volunteers. Wow! Coming, and we had food trucks and. Everything you could ever imagine, and another dance party. I might next year. I might go down and pretend to be homeless, just like for the burritos <laughs> and the dancing. Just keep growing. Just keep growing the beard. We had yeah. no, it was steak. We uh, fed them steak. Nice. We. I mean, we. Got, I got donations from amazing people. We had a full security team. Although there was no problems last yeah. year or this year, but really, what it was was a chance for people that had been afraid, that had had judgments, that had. Um, never had the chance to go to Skid Row to yeah. come down, and it was an entry point because everybody wants to be of service, whether they know it or not. Mm-hmm. People want to go and they want to experience the feeling of giving back on a day that's not Thanksgiving, or on a day that's not Christmas. Um, and people came, and now they've been able to keep in touch with people and create experiences and help get certain people Plus off the it's street. A, it's a service now. Remember this: this is a service not just to the homeless people. This is a service to the thousand people who 
broke out of their shells, yeah. drove in from Hollywood or their suburban homes in the valley into downtown yeah. LA to Skid Row. I imagine that a percentage, big percentage of them never go down to downtown Most LA. of them had never been to Skid Row before. Most of the people that came and through had never been. to open their eyes to their potential and their power to make a difference in the world. It's all about empowerment on both sides. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, the, the volunteers probably got more out of it than the homeless did. Mm -hmm. But that day was all about one thing, and that was being seen. Mm. Like we all, every human being on yeah. the planet struggles with this. I struggle with this. Like yeah. I still have issues of being seen from my childhood. Mm. And um, when you're homeless, you are completely, you're, invis you're invisible. You're not seen. You yeah. almost don't exist. Yeah. But if you suddenly see a thousand, truthfully, white people that are pretty and, you know, have money coming down and they're like, wait a second. No, I see you. What's your name? Let's just talk. I have no other agenda. Yeah. That can except be very healing. And it was the most amazing thing because they were seen. Everywhere I looked, there was someone hugging or crying. People had free hug signs. And people were just together. It was a mm, unity-building day that was empowering both sides. And the goal is like, hey, you can do this in three months. You don't have to wait till the carnival next year. You can come down and still connect. When with is the friend. carnival, by the way? It's in January every year. It's in January what? January 20th, 20, around that What's time. your actual birthday? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, 24th. Okay. Yeah. When's the 20th? Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, Aquarian brother. <laughs> Boom. So now the city of LA, uh, it looks like the city of LA is going to come in and we're going to do it with the mayor. Oh, fantastic. And the goal is to, I want to give it to the city and have it be something that actually, now it draws people in, but then there are some actual resources that can help yeah, the people. Yeah, sure. Um, that can help. Yeah, so, so uh, further transition. Transitional resources. Uh, we had dentists and psychologists last year. Yeah. Um, and, and then massages and haircuts and all these really cool things. But next year we want oh, to take it wonderful. a step further yeah. and have it be like, you know, um, actual, you know, are you someone that is yeah. ready to get off the street and let mm -hmm. us help you? And hopefully the city will come in and help a lot more that's, with that. That's fantastic. But it all started with the Baha'i quote. All of it. Um, it tell the rich about the midnight sighing of the poor. Yeah. That's 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 fantastic. And see so, all men as friends. So what uh, what do you what are you doing now? What are you working on now? I know that you've you've done a couple of apps. Shout, shout was an app, a Baha'i inspired app that uh, had great intentions yeah. intentions, but just didn't quite work. Yes. Yeah, and I we we did that together. Right. Um, it was a beautiful learning experience. I was trying to solve a problem uh, that. You know, the, the big thing about entrepreneur entrepreneurs is that, you know, when they're successful, they're solving problems that the world sees are problems. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to solve a problem that the world didn't see was a problem. Um, social media and how we use it and the, neg the negative aspects of it and the I, 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 me, me, me part of it. Yeah, you know, the narcissism Abdul that's yeah. inherent in it. Abdul Baha says, I, 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 me, 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 me. These are the curse words of the future. And... Uh, Everywhere you look on Does social he media. really say that? I've yeah. never read that quote before. Yeah, so the story is he was in the backseat of a car um, and he was being driven somewhere and uh, he was asleep. At least the two men in the front thought he was asleep. And he was being driven somewhere and the two men in the front were talking and uh, as the story goes, suddenly Abdu'l-Bahá woke up and he was frustrated and he says, I, 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 me, 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 these are the curse words of the future. Because the men were just talking about themselves the whole time. Um, and I love that quote because it's literally, like, if you think about what the faith is, it's yeah. exactly what it is. It's all, I, 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 me, me. These, these are curse and words. Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat is. is just, I, 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 me, me, me. Can you imagine what Abdul Baha would be saying right yeah. now? Um, actually, he'd be empowering us. To I do think something. this brings up a bigger question, which uh, I think you touched on, which is the world right now a large part of the Western world, stuff is working. You know, people generally out where I live, they're generally pretty happy and they've got material means and they're enjoying social media and they've got jobs and there's, they have, you know, their families are healthy and, and whatnot. And so there isn't that need that I think will be coming in the future uh, difficult times that are undoubtedly coming in the next couple decades uh, to see like, oh, we need a spiritual solution to what's wrong in the world. And certainly they know that there are poor people and there are starving people out there in the world, but there's such a disconnect from suburban Los Angeles to that. Um, there's mm -hmm. even a disconnect in suburban Los Angeles to the fact that you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a 30% increase in 
suicide in in suicide and depression in teenagers. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Um, and it's an epidemic. It's an if there was a 30% epidemic. increase in anything else, people would be like uh, up in arms. 30% increase in suicide. So until society realizes that there's uh, a big problem that needs fixing, because I, I still think that contemporary Western society thinks that politics can fix things. Yeah. If we get the right president in there, then that will take care of things. Or if they can just vote in the right way and we can have the right Congress then, or, or, or have the not, right nonprofit or the right bill passed, mm. or we can use these old systems. and Because those systems haven't completely broken down yet. They're getting there. They're pretty darn close. But yeah, it's very true. That's why I, I, uh, Last weekend, I got the chance to give the commencement speech at my high school graduation. Oh, which was, great. Which was a big honor considering... Apple, what's it I, called? So, no, this was at South Medford. It was more in the city. Okay. It was the, there was no high school out there. Okay. Um, and what I found was when I met with the students beforehand was there was five suicides. Wow. And they were in saying... In a class of how many? 400. 400. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I, I was pretty shocked, but what they were saying was that it's becoming an actual uh, viable option. And the teachers aren't able to talk about how they're they don't they're not able to talk about the students and remembering them and things like that because mm-hmm. then you're in some way saying oh if you kill yourself you'll be remembered because everybody's trying to be seen wow. and you know if you look at what social media does it essentially just gives one person a way to compare their life to another but that's so the whole thing with teens and young people about popularity in social media and if they don't get enough likes on their Instagram or if yeah. they get they get bullied now. On Snapchat and on Twitter it's, instead of in person, and yeah. it's so it you're removed. So loaded. You're removed, and so that was why I created bringing it back. That's why I created Shout. Was it was a way to it was a way to interact online that was all virtues based. So instead of Tinder, how you swipe people, you know, because you're attractive and you want to date, your friends would show up and you would swipe people and endorse them for positive things. I just want to say I'm a crotchety old man because I'm 50 years old now. I get to be crotchety. Yeah. This whole idea of dating people just based on looks and on instant uh, summing them up, <laughs> it's like it's the most anti-spiritual thing I've ever heard of in my life. When We weren't very successful at relationships, us folks who kind of came of age in the 80s and 90s. But, but at least when we would date people, it's because... We did a play with them, or yeah. we got to know them, or we were on a sports team with them, or we were on the debate club with them, um, and so you would get to know them and date. And now this whole idea of just like swipe, yeah. swipe left and right. The psychologists are saying that people are subconsciously swiping when they meet people now, meaning like I just met you. You're a potential woman that I might want to date. Within a second, I've in my mind swiped left or right. Wow. So there's no, you have no chance. Yeah. Either you have a chance or you don't. We're doing this uh, new show on Soul Pancake that's about this very thing. And oh man, Shabnam's going to kill me because I can't remember the title of it. But it's about first impressions. So we bring two people into the room and say, what, uh, you know, I love that. interested or not? Or what's your first impression? And they talk about like just in meeting the person, what they think. And then they have a conversation and really get to know the person. And they find out like, oh, both people's lost their fathers over the last year. And that they both love Spain or whatever it is. And they realize that, oh, they have so much more mm. to get to know about each other. And there's so much more interest there than on that first. Can you imagine just seeing someone's genetic structure and making a decision about that person it's crazy no it's absolutely and that's the problem that's why 60 something percent of marriages are failing and we and there's no statistics on gen z and millennials on what's going to happen with marriages and things like that right. I, and just in my group of friends i've seen marriages fall apart that have you know in recent years and they've just been married so it's just it's going in a not so great a direction so that's one of the things that um yes what i'm doing now is one of the big things i'm focused on because uh, you, you can't change everything. And I think you can almost dilute yourself by trying to do too many things. Sure. But something that I'm specifically focused on right now is the idea of redefining what it means to be a man. Mm. I might call it redefining masculinity. And I'm using my mini platform to talk about things that I just don't think men talk about. Um, I keep getting re- this idea keeps getting reinforced in me. You know, when I see these girls write hashtag goals and all these things that they write on your Instagram and Twitter, and 
you know, even young men looking up to you after in a certain way, I realized that there's a there's a power and a responsibility that I felt like I had to be a role model that I never had. You know, I never had a young, cool Baha'i guy growing up to look at who was on a TV show that was, was in shape and an athlete and, you know, might be able to get girls if he wasn't married and yet he was choosing to not drink. I never had someone like that. So... I'm really dedicated to figuring out how I can, through my deeds um, and my actions, be an example to help change the conversation of what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. um, so the empowerment of women, seeing, as Abdul Baha says, uh, women, that mankind is like into two wings of a bird, and, uh, not until both wings are equal can humanity fly. Um, and uh, so the empowerment of women and talking and being vulnerable, talking about things like therapy and getting and knowing ourselves. You know, we mm -hmm. talked about this quote by Hollis, you know, man must know what leads himself to loftiness or abasement. Um, and so this idea of knowing why I do things and the choices that I make so that I can be the best version he of myself. He who knows God knows himself is from the Quran, but uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha both yeah. quote that. And so that's something that I'm very active in is kind of letting men be okay finding who they are, treating women nice, being f like How are you going to do men? this? I mean, you're doing this, you have a company, Wayfarer uh, Entertainment, that's your kind of production company. Are you doing it through Wayfarer? Are you, uh, so I'm doing it through, I'm doing it through a mix of my social media, uh -huh. you know, um, uh, and Instagram and Twitter, and also we're creating shows at Wayfarer that tackle this same subject. Mm -hmm. um, in the scripted world and the unscripted world, um, we're doing a show called Men's Room, which I'm really excited about, which you'll have to come and be a part of. We're getting a group of celebrity men together and we're going to talk about, we're going to have conversations like this, mm -hmm. like talk about dating and love and faith and um, vulnerability and women and it's a show. Are you having it in an actual men's room with urinals? No. It's going to be in a restaurant oh. with a celebrity chef. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but that would have been pretty cool. All right. Same, same steak that you're giving to the homeless? The, Probably, probably the, the homeless get the better steak. But yeah, things All like right. that. So those kind of conversations. And then at Wayfair, we're just, you know, just like Soul Pancake, we're just trying to um, hit on contemporary issues that um, can inspire people or help them remember or see. Like the purpose of Wayfair is to create content that helps people remember, right? That word, remember. And my Muslim partner, Ahmed, Ahmed. he actually was the one that taught me that um, ensan, the Arabic word for human, means they who forget. So together, as we were building and starting to build this company and what our vision was for it, um, that idea of creating media that helps us remember who we are, mm. remember our potential, remember that we are mortal, like mm -hmm. my last days, mm -hmm. remember that we are humans, so yeah. when you pass by another human on the street, you don't ignore them, remember that we all have needs and wants and love and we yeah. need these things, that's what our mission is at Wayfair, that's what we're working on actively now. So. So that's what that's that's what I'm very invested in. That's fantastic, um, Justin. This has been a delight in talking to you. I guess Maya fell asleep. She's been asleep this whole time. I think she did. Do you think Emily? Maybe did you do it, Emily? She might still be yeah, in the crib. She might still be in the crib. We gotta go check on her. Yeah, but it's good. Um, this has been really great. And My Last Days is has made its move to the CW. It's going to be on the actual CW we Network. We successfully transitioned the next it. next season. And when is that yeah. airing? So August uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th. Fantastic. We're doing a three-night television special event uh, broadcast around the whole country. And there'll be six new documentaries that will be airing online. And then you can go online, or airing on television, and then you can go online and you can watch them in full. The 30 minute documentaries on CWTV.com. Oh, so that's fantastic. We all did it together. So excited. Thanks, Justin. Thank you so much. Thank you for the service. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night.